hi everyone. I am Leilani. I'm the uh, one of the co-presidents of PST, which is the Philosophy, uh, Philosophy Honor Society. Um, if you didn't know, um, which is uh, sponsored by um, Dr. Ann Wiles, um, and she teaches um, intro to philosophy as well as ancient Greek philosophy here at JMU. And I'm here to introduce um, a great professor and doctor of philosophy um, for one of our first talks in a series of seminars that we're doing. And the theme is hermeneutics, language, and meaning in the liberal arts. Um, and we are so lucky to have been sponsored by the Student Government Association. So we've received funding to bring out amazing professors such as um, the one that you're going to see today. Um, and his name is Dr. John Cutteback, and he is a professor at Christendom College in Front Royal, Virginia. Um, he is very well known for a book that he wrote called Friendship, The Art of Happiness, which discusses the philosophy of friendship. Um, and he is going to present a philosophy talk called The Hermeneutics of Aristotelian Friendship. And if you're interested in this topic, or if you're interested in this theme, we also have another talk coming up on Thursday, March 2nd, which is next week on Thursday at 7 p.m. And it's going to be on understanding how we understand, dialogue, and interpretation. So with that being said, um, and as long as everyone uh, gets their papers, um, I will turn it over to him, and if you have any questions about any of the upcoming talks, there's going to be five total, um, we can direct you to the information that you need, and it will also be available in the Department of Philosophy. Thank you very much. I appreciate the kind uh, introduction as well as your, your invitation to join you. Um, I, I have to say, I, I had the honor to give a lecture here some number of years ago, and I've, and, and I've referred to it a number of times with my students as uh, one of the most delightful experiences I've had, I'm not trying to put any pressure on you, but um, I, I, I found the students here uh, surprisingly interested, not surprising because I thought JMU would be any less than that, but just in, in general uh, to get interest in philosophical topics at uh, undergraduate universities is not always the easiest of things. And uh, so in any case, it's a, a delight and a pleasure for me to be back, and I, I do thank you for having me. Uh, this, this, this title is, is a pretty imposing one, and if, 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 as some people have said, philosophy is about power, then there's certain words that philosophers might use that have a pretty good intimidation factor. And I think hermeneutics has got to be up there pretty high on the intimidation factor if you're if you're a philosophy major and you're out there at a cocktail party and you take out the word hermeneutics at the right time, that can really shoot you right to the top of the conversation, where in general, if you just say it as though you know what it means, no one's going to question you. So it's all, it's all, in, the, it's all in the confidence. Um, so I, now you're wondering, is that what, is that what he's going to do in this lecture? Well, I'll, uh, I'll let you be the judge of that as we, as we proceed. Um, there were two questions in my, in my research. I have to say hermeneutics is not particularly my area. Um, Aristotle on friendship is particularly my area. And in looking into what uh, some different philosophers who are into more into hermeneutics look at, I found there were two very interesting questions that they raise about friendship. I thought you might be interested in them. I find them very interesting, and it's those two things that I'm going to uh, address here with you. And the first question is, every time we speak, are we asking to be heard as by a friend? Every time we speak, are we asking to be heard as by a friend? I, 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 I like that question very much. And the other question I, I, I like very much also, are there at the end of the day any true friends? How's that for a good question? Are there, please come, come right in. Are, are there actually any true friends? It's obviously connected to the first one. Those interested in hermeneutics are looking particularly at the use of language and to whom it is addressed. And so it's a very good question. How do you see those to whom we are addressing what we say? Does one, should one see them, expect them to be 
friendly or as friends to you in what you are saying? If that's an important question, I think it is, then obviously another very important question is, are there really any people out there who are capable of listening to you as friends listen to friends? So those are two things that I'm going to look at here, and I want to tell you something right up front. My main interest is to be able to make a difference in life. In this way, I follow my teachers, and right here, come right in if you might, it's not a problem. Um, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, when they studied philosophy, they had a conviction that it makes a difference for life. One thing that I love in, at the very beginning of Aristotle's ethics is he basically says, he just says directly to the people that are starting to study ethics, why are you doing this? As far as I'm concerned, says Aristotle, there's only one good reason to study ethics. If you are interested in changing your life. I'm not saying this to you to be giving you a sermon. I'm telling you what Aristotle says. He, as a philosopher, talking about the science of ethics, says, what point would there be in asking questions about the good life, if not ultimately to try to put into practice what we've come to see. Obviously, that does mean that he takes as a given, not as though he's simply assuming it, he thinks it's a very rational thing that you can conclude from experience, that there are key truths you can see about your life, which truths, if we put them in the practice, will make a very big difference. So I tell you up front, that's my main interest. My main interest in, in Aristotle and friendship is not historical. I have found that it makes a very big difference in my life. That's particularly why I like studying it and why I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share some of it with you. So a couple quick um, principles about friendship, and then we're going to look at those two questions. But do have on hand, sorry, to your copy of the um, handout, and a couple people just come in later over here. And they you, and maybe, Dan, you have one over there, you know, him and laid over there. First quotation. There is nothing so characteristic of friends as living together. I, I, in, in certain ways, in, in my mind, a good philosopher is a master of the obvious. For there's nothing so characteristic of friends as living together. But, of course, always in, in good statements, there is more there than meets the eye. As I always say to my students, there's living together, and then there's living together. And the difference makes all the difference. Friends, <coughs> real friends, live together in some very meaningful sense of that term. And depending on what kind of friendship it is, there'll be different kinds of <coughs> living together. But friendship will always be about living together. And then particularly, and we're going to come back to this when we come a little bit later, look at another quotation here. For Aristotle, most of all, human living together is done in conversation. And so for Aristotle, at the heart of any real relationship is always going to be conversation. For Aristotle, if you want to judge the relationship, get a sense of where it is, get a sense of what kind it is, you need to look at the kind of conversation that goes on there. So, what do, we, what do I want to do now? Again, two parts. First part, every time we speak, are we asking to be heard as by a friend? And then the question of, are there any true friends at all? The first part is just a little longer, and then we'll go to the second part. This is not going to be a long lecture. There's nothing, nothing worse than a long lecture in a small classroom where if you're afraid if you start to fall asleep, I'm going to come over and tickle you or something. Well, I might, so don't fall asleep, but it's not going to be so long that that's going to be a danger. All right, so, in our first part, the main interest I have then is distinguishing between different kinds of friendship. This is my favorite thing in Aristotle. I find it extremely useful. He's very clear in laying out some fundamental distinctions about the different kinds of friendship. And, and to me, this is highly practical. What more important is there? Come on, let me take off my jacket. What more important is there in your life than to be able to look at your relationships and ask yourself, what? is the status of this relationship. What kind of relationship is this? What Aristotle's division of different kinds of friendship does is it gives us, I'd say, the categories to be able to think clearly about this. We need, for very concrete, practical reasons, to be able to think clearly about 
making the distinction, we would, our, our, our life will be in shambles if we don't see that there are necessarily different kinds of relationships and, and indeed different kinds of friendships that need to be going on in our lives. But if we don't have a clear sense of which is which and what the difference is, then this is going to be a real problem. So I want to particularly distinguish the different kinds of friendship here, focusing on particularly the kind of conversation that goes on in each. And I'm particularly going to emphasize it from the side of kind of listening and hearing. So a central theme I want to have be here is listening and hearing as central to conversation, which is central to friendship. So right now we want to look at a few different kinds. I'm going to begin with a little trio here that I hope will become more clear as we proceed and then we use Aristotle to try to defend it. Here I think is a kind of prescription of what Aristotle would suggest based on the distinctions we're about to make. We should be friendly to everybody. We should have pleasant or useful friendships with some, and then we should have true friendships with a very few. So again, that little that little tree. Okay, quick, quick. The, the windows don't open, do they? I didn't know, try. What did you try? Are, are, are you all hot, or am I just so excited about this lecture that no, it's not hot? Really hot. Okay. I, I don't mean to break things up here, but. Um, There we go. Say that. What's the story of Thales? That he fell in a, in, in a ditch as he was walking? I'm not a good enough philosopher to fall in a ditch. So I, I would actually walk around. Look where I'm walking. Yeah, hey, no problem. All right, we'll see what we can do. If you, if you can't, don't sweat it. No, no, no pressure. All right, so friendly to all, pleasant or useful friendships with some, true friendship, full friendship with a very small number of people. I mean, all, right off the bat already, I mean, doesn't that just ring true to, to be able to sort that out? Well, all right, let's look. First of all, then what we need to talk about is the virtue of friendliness. I, I love, this comes in book four of the Ethics. He's going through different virtues. One of the virtues he calls the virtue of friendliness. The virtue of friendliness has the name friendliness because when you have this virtue, you have you act in some ways like a friend towards everybody. But at the same time, you do not make the serious mistake of acting as though everybody's your friend. There's a very big difference. To have the virtue of friendliness is to have a, an habitual disposition to act in a friendly way towards everybody. And what he particularly is concerned about with this virtue is in social situations. So what this virtue specifically has to do with, for any Aristotelian virtue, I always have to say what the area is that it has to do with. It has to do with the interchange of words in social situations. So what he says is, the person who has this virtue, again, a virtue is always a good habit, a good firm disposition. You have, you have a disposition to say what is right at the right time. But no, not, not, not simply in some type of suave way or as a sophist would to say that what's right for the sake of, of, of winning friends and influencing people, but rather in the sense of for the genuine good of people. I, I, I've always thought this is so beautiful, it's so simple. For the genuine good of people, you're always looking for what good word could I say right now? How could I encourage this person? How could I build this person up? And this is literally what he said. He also says that, by the way, someone who has this virtue is not a flatterer. Sometimes you have to offer a correction because sometimes really caring for somebody or treating someone right means that you offer a certain correction. So we, we have this virtue that he thinks is a virtue that everybody should have. It's the virtue in English, in any case, is rendered as being friendliness. And so it, 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 it's so appropriate to think how a big part of this is actually, I'd say, in manners, in etiquette, in having just a basic appropriate sympathy and awareness of people that you should have. So no, some of this virtue, right off the bat, is going to know how to listen to people. Now this is a certain kind of listening, it's a limited listening, but, but in, in social situations, 
are, are we able to you know, be kind and just, just receive what people have to say and basically I'd say even just kind of in et etiquette manners, I, I'm tuned in, I'm listening, even if I'm just being, I'm just meeting you, I'm not already looking to the next person. Right, so there's a kind of listening involved in having this virtue. But no, note how limited it is. I mean, in, in, social pardon me, in social circumstances, how deep a conversation are you ever going to have? So it's not, it's not as though this requires some, some super deep kind of listening, as though the person with virtue is going around and every person who plugs in is just like, I am 100% here for you. Let's have a deep conversation right now. That's silly. But it is being open and willing to hear but in a limited kind of way. All right, so let's look then at the friendships. Now we go into friendships, meaning real friendships, not just one person having a virtue called friendliness. First two kinds of friendships he basically lumps together is the friendship of the pleasant and the friendship of, of usefulness or of utility. There's a couple key characteristics that you should remember about these. As any kind of friendship, there has to be a reciprocality there has to be both people are aware of the friendship and they have a reciprocal recognized goodwill. That's the kind of easy memorable phrase for Aristotle. If it's going to be a friendship, it's got to be a reciprocal recognized goodwill. Reciprocal means going both ways, of course. Recognized means both people are aware of it. And there has to be some type of goodwill, otherwise you wouldn't call it friendship. So there's a reciprocal recognized goodwill, but what is it rooted in? Well, this is where he has the simple point. If it's rooted in the fact of, you know what, this person's useful to me, then this is what's called a friendship of utility. If it's more rooted in, you know, we just enjoy being together, then it's a friendship of the pleasant. It takes a certain nuance to understand what Aristotle's going after here. It becomes, if you think about it, it becomes immediately clear such friendships could end up being bad. He says bad people are capable of having these, but at the same time, He's very clear, they're not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily bad to have a relationship, again, particularly if it's recognized as such, that what is the nature of this friendship? We enjoy being together, so we do some stuff together. We're, we're kind of in the same friend group. I'm gonna call you if, I'm, if, if we're going out in, in a group. We enjoy being together. Then, as now, you use the word friend for that kind of person. So it's just a friendship of the pleasant. or well, the friendship of utility, you particularly can think of kind of a business relationship. Think, think of people who do, do business together. They normally do call each other friends. Interesting, linguistically, things were the same then in many ways as they are now. There, it, it's a real use of the term friend. But yeah, he's my business friend. Sure. And, you know, I do this for him, he does this for me. All right. Two quick things to note about this kind of friendship that sets it apart from the one that's coming up next. You do not really know the other for who he is. This is not based upon a deeper kind of knowledge. It's not, this is not based upon a deep intimacy with the person. You, you know some things about the person, but not necessarily very much. The other thing is, you do not, it's not based in willing good to the other person for his own sake. It's not based in willing good to the other person for his own sake. It's more based in, again, not necessarily in a crass, ugly, selfish way, but it's just kind of, hey, I enjoy being around you. This is why we spend time together. This isn't especially about I've plugged in to see what your good is and I'm in this relationship because I want to build something deep where I'm looking out for you. That's coming up. That's a different kind of thing. So just fundamentally, you know the other person, but it's not a deep knowledge where you really have a sense of who the person is. And it's, and it's rooted more in really ultimately your own self-interest. Again, not necessarily crassly, but it, it, it's just kind of more about what I want to get here and not about my giving something. So that's the basic thumbnail sketch of these two kinds of friendship. Consider the kinds of discussions or conversations that are had here. Even here, as in the social situation, conversations are normally only so deep. Obviously you have deeper conversations with people that you call friends in this sense than you do with someone that you've just met in, in social circumstances. But nonetheless, I mean, how deep a conversation do you have with someone who just you do business with? How deep a conversation do you have with 
think of your friend group here you know, at, at, at the university that you go out with. I mean, in, in general, when you're kind of out with the group, are you going to all of a sudden kind of turn to someone and say, I'm really going through a difficult time right now. In, in, in general, that would kind of be like, um, excuse me, right? that, that, that conversation is, is not particularly going to be started there. So there are real conversations that are had with these friends, but in general, it's not, they're not so deep. You know, isn't it, isn't it interesting already here than to start to focus our attention on, on a fascinating aspect of life. Where are rich conversations going to happen? In what kind of context do they really happen? How often do they happen? I mean, we, we might, I, I think it's instructive to, to kind of get in the mindset here, if you're willing to think with me, you can ask yourself, when was the last time I had a truly rich meaningful conversation with someone about important things. Right? These, they, 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 these, this kind of conversation doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It, it actually requires quite a bit to be going on to even really be possible. Which brings us to then the, the the third level here, the, the thing that we said is only had with a few. And Aristotle, so, so, you know, when I, I look at these things a bit with students, and this is something at times they, 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 they find difficult, um, really, you can only do this with very few. Aristotle is insistent about this kind of, the real deal, the real deal of friendship is only possible with a very small number of people. And when he talks about what it is, I think, I think it becomes quite clear why. So first of all, let's just look at what a couple quick characteris ways of characterizing it that's set apart from the other two that we, just, that we just looked at. And it's the opposite of the two things that we saw about them. Here, so easy to say these two things, they're so rich. You really do know one another. You know one another for who you are. And you will the good of the other for the person's, for that person's sake. Another way of saying is kind of an un, a fundamentally unselfish love attitude towards this person. I really am interested in you. I always love to just pause uh, uh, when we say those two things. In a, in a sense, they're so obvious. It sounds so simple. It's so easy to reel them off. Well, okay, well, when there's that, then you have true friendship. I don't want to, I want to yet transition to the second question, but just to recognize right now, this is hard to do. How often is it actually done? Well, one thing that can help us consider this is how many people really, really know you? It is a fabulous question. How many people really know you? And isn't it just kind of intuitively obvious that whatever that small number of people is, everybody that's not in that group is not going to be capable of being a true friend, un unless, of course, something's done to get that person into that group. What does it take to get to know a human being? Is that, isn't, that a, isn't that a great question? Let's take a peek now. I want to, come, I want to just look a little bit at the conversation of true friends, which to me is, is, is the neatest part of what we'll look at here. The conversation of true friends, what does it actually look, at, look like? Well, one, one, a little bit of an offbeat quotation I'm giving you right here. This is actually from Thomas Aquinas' commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics. He just said in a slightly more fulsome way and trying to explain what Aristotle said, it's Aristotle's point. Let me, let me give you the context. What's the context here? Aristotle's asking this question. It's in Book 9 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Does a happy person, someone who's already achieved happiness, already achieved a human excellence, will that person necessarily and always still need human friends? Will that person still need true friendship? Aristotle thinks it's pretty obvious that you're going to need true friendship 
to get towards human greatness, to get towards virtue, to get towards happiness. But once you're there, will you always still need to have friends, otherwise you couldn't really still be a happy human being. That's the context of this, of this quotation. Therefore, kind of an interesting little metaphysical point. Therefore, just as his own existence is desirable and delightful to every virtuous man, so is his friend's existence desirable and delightful to him. Consequently, as a person rejoices in the perception of his own existence in life, so it is simply necessary for him to perceive them in his friend in order to rejoice in him. This takes place through constant association in the exchange of ideas and reflection. In this way, men, obviously humans, in this way, humans are said to dwell with one another in an appropriate manner, not as cattle feeding together, but as human beings living a life that is proper to them. That last line, powerful, it, it, it takes us back to there's living together, and then there's living together. You know, it's, it, it, there's such richness here. People to fall in love. There's a great draw to be together, to live together. But what is life? How do humans live together? How do they live together rightly? These are questions that we have to sort out. But here, particularly, he's pointing out, isn't the most properly human way of, of being together as humans is going to be in being able to have a certain kind of rich conversation. So, so, so remarkably, again, this, 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 there's, so many, there's so many neat premises that are going on in this argument, and I, I won't kill you with all the details here. One of the, one of the great premises here is Aristotle's famous notion. He's the one that just, just says this so clearly is that a friend is another self. Sounds like something you'd see in a Hallmark greeting card, but it's, I mean, consider for a moment the power of this statement. A friend is another self. How does Aristotle bear that out? Because you have an attitude towards that person that is essentially the same as your attitude towards yourself. Everybody always, as it were, truly loves oneself, at least you can do it better or not, but at least we, we have an attitude towards ourselves of wanting what's best for ourselves. And in general, we have a decent knowledge of ourselves, although of course we need to grow in self-knowledge. But the, but the point being, you turn towards another, and of course it's mutual both ways, you look towards that person as though it's you. So simply said, you will good to that person as though you're willing good to yourself. So that, that's the context then where, there, where his, he's saying, and this is where his deep um, conviction of the social nature of the human person comes through of a human person is not complete, is not happy, unless he is able to look to another that is his other self. There is no such thing in Aristotle's view. You could argue with him, but it, it's, in Aristotle's view, there's no such thing as a happy human person that is, does not have another self that he can look to and rejoice with and suffer with as though it were his own rejoicing and suffering. How are these present to one another? In conversation. Here, it seems to me, is the most profound sense of listening that can ever take place. So if you just bear in mind what we've just said then about what Aristotle means by true friendship, just consider briefly with me what this kind of conversation, especially looking at it from the viewpoint, from the side of what amazing kind of listening can go on when you really have two people that see the other as another self truly knowing the other and, 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 and seeing the person for who he is, even with weaknesses, really loving. It's a remarkable kind of context to be able to say, what kind of listening would then happen? 
it seems to me that the way that I would best try to characterize it is to put it this way. When true friends talk, when the one comes to the other and wants to share something that's going on, it's not as though it's just news that's being brought. It's kind of, here's what's happening to me with the complete confidence that the other person is going to hear this with the attitude of what's happening to you is happening to me. It does not make for just a completely different kind of setup where I'm, I'm here to share something about myself, be it deep or even not so deep, that somebody is listening who has an attitude towards me of my other self, complete and total trust, knowing we know and we are known. And we love and we are loved. So it's, it, on, on the side of the one listening, it's almost like, please tell me what's going on for what has happened to you has happened to me, though I don't know what it is yet until you tell me. You might accuse me of being overly romantic in saying that. perhaps. But in any case, it seems to me, if there's something called true friendship, it's going to look like that. And in any case, that's what, that's what Aristotle is asserting. And, it, and I, I, I would throw out, I think, I don't know if this corresponds to your experience, I would say that's the kind of listening that I need in my life, that there's at least somebody that will listen to me like that. If there's somebody that will listen to me like that, then I know I am heard. And it seems to me we all need to be heard. We need to hear and to be heard. And, and it seems to me that this is at the heart of what Aristotle's talking about here. This is the listening. I, I, I would go so far as to say, naturally speaking, in any case, without which a person will always feel somewhat alone. Even if there's many friends of the other type, if there is not some friend of this type, then there is loneliness. Then there is isolation, because it is that deep a human need. In any case, Aristotle thinks he sees that in people, and I have to be honest, I think I do too. So. Quick wrap up, and, and, and by the way, the second part is going to be much shorter than the first part. This is the end of the first part. But overall, it, it does pertain to friends to listen. So what would I conclude in answer to the, uh, the opening question there? When we speak, are we always seeking to be heard as by a friend? I think if we make the distinction between kind of those three levels that we're talking about, then it's true. In, anytime I speak, I'm at least hoping to be heard in kind of one of those three ways, at least by someone who's willing to be friendly and polite and at least receive what I'm saying on that level. That doesn't have to be super deep. Or someone that have, have something that you could call a friendship with who, who, who's going to be a little deeper with me and be able to receive what I'm saying. But then it's particularly the third. Isn't it the third that is the most important, that's the gold standard of of what you we need, of what we're looking for, when we look, when we say something, and we look to be heard. It seems to me that would be the standard against which we would judge any other hearing or listening. Would be, is there someone who can do that with me? All right. So then, the second question, which again I said I'll, I'll look at a little bit more briefly, is it, it's just the great question of are there true, true friends? It, 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 in my research here, particularly among uh, those looking through a, a kind of interest in hermeneutics at Aristotle on friendship, I had not seen this before, but it is, it is reportedly said that Aristotle said 
oh my friends, there is no friend. Now, frankly, whether he said this or not doesn't particularly matter, but in any case, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it can be used to raise this question. And of course, there's a funny little play there. Can you ever say, oh my friends, there is no friend? <coughs> a couple different ways that might be taken. Could that be, oh, oh my friends, in the sense of, they are friends in the sense of pleasure or utility, but where, where's a true friend? Oh, my friends, I've got friends, friends everywhere, but no friends, right? That would be a pretty powerful way of taking that. Or could it be taken in, in, in the sense of friends, in the sense of someone I'd like to be a friend? Aristotle himself is going to say it's, it's a beginning of friendship just to want to be friends, though wanting to be friends does not friendship make. Wanting to be friends is the beginning of a friendship. So maybe all my friends in the sense of, I want to be friends with you, but there is no friendship, right? I mean, it, it, is this a kind of cry of despair? Well, let, let's look. Aristotle himself does say in the Nicomachean Ethics that true friendship is rare. To me, this is very dramatic. He's made, he's made quite clear that there's really not going to be human happiness without it. And then he proceeds to say why he thinks it's rare. I, I, I don't know, but it, it, this might be a key to understanding much of what goes on around us as regards perhaps a lot of unhappiness. Perhaps, perhaps there's something to what Aristotle's saying here, and I just I toss, this, toss this out at you. Why, his two reasons that he gives as to why true friendship is so rare, and the other kinds are not rare, but true friendship is rare, comes down to time and virtue. Time and virtue. In other words, it takes a long time to become true friends, and it takes a certain kind of character. I'm looking at the second quotation right now on the handout. Okay. What's natural, and this is right after he's gone through talking about what true friendship is, it's natural that such friendships should be infrequent, for such men are rare. What he means by that is men that have a certain kind of character that would be required in order to do this. Further, such friendship requires time and familiarity. As the proverb says, men cannot know each other till they have eaten salt together, nor can they admit each other to friendship or be friends till each has been found lovable and been trusted by each other. Those who quickly show the marks of friendship to each other wish to be friends, but are, that's supposed to say not, but are not friends unless they both are lovable and know the facts. For a wish for friendship may arise quickly, but friendship does not. This, 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 this very profound point of what does it take to get to know a human person? I, 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 Aristotle, he, he, keeps, he keeps coming back to this. And um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go overly ex experiential here, but isn't it rather remarkable how that doesn't experience show you really can think that you've known somebody, and then one day you find out that you did. Th this this is an essential part of what is of, of what he's talking about here, and and you can see why. <coughs> There are plenty of people who will say from their experience, well, right here, so they can say, yeah, okay, yeah, it takes a long time to get to know, and, and, indeed, and even then, who is there that you can really trust? Who is there that is stable and steady enough that you can have confidence in the person enduringly that you'll know what you've got? And it's not going to be tomorrow morning, well, now what do we have, right? But isn't it interesting? Note how the two points he said fit together there. It takes a long time to get to know someone, and the person has to have a certain kind of character. This is, this is classic Aristotelian anthropology. You have to have a certain stability of character. It, it isn't in Aristotle's view. There are people, I dare say many people, that you're not really going to be able to trust in the friendship kind of way because they haven't become the stable kind of character that, frankly, 
is trustworthy. Right? And so you see how it's kind of it's kind of a one-two punch that he that he that he has there. So we, we might then put the drama this way, connecting it back to our first point. Where are the people capable of true friendship, or we, we could cast it like this, where are the people in the world who really are capable of hearing, of listening to someone the way a true friend would? Isn't that really the question of, is true friendship possible? Are there people that can do that? It seems to me you could reduce the question to. But perhaps better put, I like to tend in this direction in, in the spirit of, we study ethics most of all for the sake, for our, for our own sake of, of, of looking at our own life. Perhaps the drama of life is this. Will I ever be the kind of person that actually can listen to people? So that, it would seem, is in my control. And I'm, I, I just like to throw out then, in, in moving towards the conclusion then, in view of the two points that Aristotle has said here about that makes true friendship be difficult, that makes then true listening, the ability to listen, be so difficult. What I want to throw out at you is, is, is a couple things that I think we could, if, if we want to think with Aristotle. If you want to think with Aristotle here, some questions we could ask ourselves as regards this issue of, Am I the kind of person that would be capable of being someone's friend? Am I the kind of person that's capable of listening? Well, the first one is, you know, that, that ever tricky and controversial V word of, 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 of virtue. According to me, at the epicenter of Aristotle's view of, of life and friendship, which I think is practically the same thing, life and friendship for Aristotle can, can practically be interchanged because friendship is just sharing life, life in the true sense. It, it is this, is to see the connection between virtue and being able to stand in a relationship. Aristotle, Aristotle will assert, ladies and gentlemen, without bashfulness, he would say to you, you are only capable of having a good relationship to the extent that you have a good moral character. That might not be the most politically correct thing to say, but it's absolutely where Aristotle is, is, is thinking. You are only really capable of standing in the kind of relationship that, according to Aristotle, we most of all need and want if we're not going to be lonely and happy, unhappy. We only are capable of that to the extent that we have a certain kinds of character. From my viewpoint in teaching and trying to understand Aristotelian ethics, to me this is the most interesting point. At the end of the day, I think, in Aristotle's view, the biggest reason to be concerned, naturally speaking, about whether we have virtues or not, is this point of the connection of virtue to our ability to stand in good relationships. That if he's right, is certainly, it seems to me, a good reason to be concerned about, am I a courageous person? Am I a patient person? Am I a temperate person? Because in, in his mind, these are precisely the things that enable us to be there for and with other people. See, that it, it gives that great new angle. It's not, it's not just as though just be that for its own sake, although it does hold that they're worthy in themselves. We, we could look at different I I examples. I'm gonna just gonna, gonna give the one of, of honesty. You know, it, it's, it's, you can say, oh, that, you know, it's an easy one, it's kind of a throwaway one, but of course, I mean, the, the virtue of honesty really is a rather dramatic thing. Is it really the case that one has, has gotten to the point where habitually someone can have absolute confidence that what's coming out of my mouth is, is simply the truth in the sense of what I, what I would be perceiving to be the true thing. Right? Can, can you really have confidence in that person? That person said it. There's nothing more to discuss here. But that actually is a pretty dramatic thing. But think, it's, it's so obvious, but, but worth noting. How, how, how could there possibly be what he's calling true friendship? Unless someone, not just someone, really anyone, right? If, if, uh, the, 
does, does one lie to other people but then tell the truth to one's friends? Let's go to the, let's go to the, let's go to the time, time point. There's time spent together and there's time spent together. What kind of time, when, it, when Aristotle says it takes a long time, what kind of time does it really take to get to know people? What I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to here make a, 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 a kind of an assertion to you and then just make a couple suggestions as to how one might think about it. I think that our culture is losing the contexts and the habits of spending time together well, meaning of spending time together in a way that helps people get to know one another. I think we're losing the context for that kind of human interaction. We're losing the habits that one needs to be able to have that kind of interaction. And, 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 and here, I, I won't be able to sufficiently defend that. I know it's a little bit, you know, of a bold statement to say, but I'm just going to toss out there a couple things that might be worth worth considering there. Are, are, here's a way, if I might say, as, as, as undergrad, so look, I've been teaching in an undergrad institution for 20 years, and frankly, at least a third of my time is is talking with, with students about their life. And so I, I, I try to be tuned in to, to what's going on. And are the general habits of interaction among college students today in general conducive to people really getting to know one another. There's just kind of a challenge I would throw out to you for, for reflection. Are the general <coughs> habits that we have as undergrads, or grads, or whatever, conducive to really getting to know people? There's so many different things we could look at there. It, it, another, another angle on that. How about, the in, how about the influence of communication technology? This might seem like a low-lying fruit, or I don't know, maybe it's controversial at all. It depends on how one is thinking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss out a book that you might be interested in here by Sherry Turkle called Reclaiming Conversation. Reclaiming Conversation is that great word that Aristotle used. It's called The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. She's a I forget what, in some Ivy League schools, she's a sociologist, she's uh, this, that, and the other, it's a, it, it, and it's very powerful, very powerful. What's, what's her basic thesis? The communication technology, if you look particularly at, 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 at people that have now been growing up with this for several years, has significantly reduced people's ability to even communicate and understand and hear and empathize with what other people are saying. And that this can be shown by dramatic data. What's one going to do with that? Well, that's one of my favorite topics. And in any case, I just raised that. What, what, what about entertainment practices that we take for granted? Are they ultimately conducive to getting to know one another or not. It seems to me a good case can be made that we have a problem there. How about just in general, silence, which in general is this, in my view, you could say silence is the space in which people can really be together in any richer kind of way. Are there simply spaces for it? So here I'm, 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 I'm trying to reflect in a practical way as regards this whole issue of it takes a long time to get to know one, but then again, even with a long time, if we don't have the right context, if we don't have the right practices, can you be around people for a very, very, very long time and not know them? Because certain kinds of human contact just weren't made. So where would that leave us? So, is, is true friendship possible? Well, I, I, I would throw out there, if I can become capable of really listening to people, but I think the answer to that question is yes. It seems to me that is the way. My immediate issue is not, I can't immediately control whether you're going to be able to listen to me or not. One thing that's immediately in my control is whether I'm the kind of person that someone might one day say, for goodness sake, that guy actually hears me when I speak to him. It seems to me, if I can do that, then 
someone else can do that, and true friendship is possible, and honestly, if, if that's so, I don't see who is going to be able to shake my confidence in that. In any case, at least if I can make some general progress in that direction. I conclude by saying this to you. I, I, I recently gave a lecture on friendship where I, I, I opened by saying, you know, it would seem that someone should be giving this lecture to you who's actually had some reasonable success in this in their life. And, uh, but no, lo and behold, you have me here speaking to you about friendship. And uh, uh, honestly, uh, every now and then, it, it is deeply humiliating when I look at sometimes the wreckage in my own life and I, and I say, <laughs> and I wrote a book on friendship. That, that's really embarrassing. <laughs> Nonetheless, at the end of the day, it seems to me, the more we succeed, yes, in doing it, the more we will understand it. Only those who really do it will really be able to understand it. Absolutely. Nonetheless, maybe for those of us that are still trying, studying it, like studying it in Aristotle, seems to me to still be a great step. At least if I'm studying it, then I know what I'm looking for. And if I know what I'm looking for, I might stand a chance of being able to do it, and I thank you for your attention. I should have said thank you for listening to me. <laughs> so, I, I, I am open to questions, or maybe this is where you stampede me trying to leave, but um, should we have a little uh, uh, um, a question? And if someone needs to go, of course, please. But, um, um, are there any questions out there? Yes, sir. Uh, do you necessarily have to be a happy man to have the ability to listen in order to develop true friendships with them? Does that just kind of come as a result of being happy? That's a great question. And of course, it, it, key here is what do we mean by happy? And, and one of the biggest problems it, of, of the term happy is I, language is always so key. What I use the term happy in a context where I've been reading Aristotle a lot, and that's how you render in English your daimonia. But, in, but to, those, to, to normal people, when you hear the word happy, what rings in your ear is more like kind of that happy feeling. Or, I'm not very happy today, which is obviously related, but it's not really the same thing. So, key to the way I'm using the term happy, so we would have to clarify that. The way I'm using the term happy is happiness is absolutely compatible, for instance, with suffering, right? I, I mean, I, I hope maybe you've had that blessing in your life to know some people that have suffered more than you'd even like to think about, but who are clearly remarkable people who are fundamentally happy in Aristotle's sense. They are fulfilled human beings. They live in communion, in relationships with other people, in which relationships they know it matters not in some sense what I suffer, for I am never alone. So, do it, so using happy in that sense, it, 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 the great thing is in the Aristotelian context that that happiness is basically hand in hand with virtue. Really, I mean, the more kind of character we have, right, the more we're able to be that, right? The great thing for Aristotle is happiness isn't a reward for being virtuous. It actually is the very enacting of being virtuous. So in that sense, to really be the, the person who can listen, you do have to be happy in the sense of having a certain kind of character. But you certainly don't have to have that happy feeling. And very often, I dare say, it's, it's those who have suffered most that have the best ear to hear other people. I, I mean, you know, you know how those who have suffered at, at times, they, it's not that they turn what you're saying immediately to be like, oh, you think that's bad? Let me tell you about what I've been through. But they're able to just go, I know. Right? I mean, just so, so, am I addressing your question? Yeah, in, in the Aristotelian sense, happy. Then I think, right, yeah. put it together with virtue. Then it's that, and so that's why I'm suggesting this whole notion of 
of ability to hear <coughs> is a fundamental human quality that has to be that has to be cultivated in the very same way, for instance, that you would that you would cultivate virtue. How's that? Any other questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned how um, what Aristotle was saying was to have true friends. It kind of takes a long time. It takes time and effort. And you're gonna love, there's a lot of arguments being made that in our era right now, there's an obsession with having a quantity of friends as opposed to having yeah. to really being okay with having two or three friends that you really right. connect with. Why do you think there's been a shift towards the obsession with quantity? Do you think that's techno technological or cultural or a combo of both? Great, great. Uh, uh, great question, and, and it seems to me that's complex. And I, I just, uh, I, my immediate thought is that you know, probably, as you're intuiting and thinking yourself, I think it, it's it's you know, these things always feed off back and forth, right? I mean, the fo the founders of Facebook were brilliant, if for no other reason than this, the, the word friendship is extremely powerful. I mean, isn't it? I mean, we, in many ways, we think we stand above such things. Well, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be swept in by thinking I've got a lot of friends because I've got a lot of friends on Facebook. But then again, we are swept in by. Obviously, we communally are swept in by that, and we actually put stock in it. It was brilliant to use that word, and so that that could even be done. Ordi says something about how we were thinking. I think, but it also clearly feeds back into it, doesn't it? That, it? that it, I mean, it can't, but in any case, subconsciously, if not consciously, make us have a more banal view of what friends are and as, as something to, to have a lot of. And I, the only other quick thought I have is I wonder whether it's also, you know, to the extent that our culture really has communally given up on virtue, in the Aristotelian sense of virtue, I mean, it's 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 downright offensive to people to claim that they'd be happier if they were virtuous. Right? People are offended by that. That's a very dramatic situation. So the fact that we've given up on virtue means we are becoming. I mean, to me, this is one again one of the greatest ways to see the tragedy of a culture that's given up in its inheritance, is embarrassed of, of speaking about temperance as though it's something you know, that's good, et cetera. Right? So, but we've given up on trying to form young people as, don't just clarify what you think is right, here's what the tradition has some insights about, about certain ways of acting that are in fact better for you. Right? Now, you, I'm just saying that, and as an Aristotelian, this is one thing that make, it, it, it's kind of straightforward. I can just, there's a, there's Aristotle. But to the extent that we've given up on that, then we aren't capable of the deeper kind of friendship. So maybe the move towards quantity is, for goodness sake, people need to feel like they're having some type of contact. And that, that frankly goes back even to that, uh, some of the things in, in that book that I mentioned, Reclaiming Conversation. It becomes this kind of addiction where there's this, where's this vicious cycle of, I, I need to feel like someone's getting in touch with me. And so the first thing I do when I come out of the classroom or come out of wherever is I'm checking to see if, for goodness sake, has someone sent me a text message, you know, as, because I somehow feel connected by that. I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to be offensive, but I think that's a serious sign of our, our breakdown of, of, of what we're looking for that, we're, that, we've, that we've had taken away from us, the deeper ways of being together as human beings. So we, so we go for the quantity shallow stuff. Sorry, that was my supposedly quick thought on you. Am, am I, do you want to do you want to share a thought or follow up? No, that um, that all makes um, makes sense in terms of relating it back to Aristotle and also relating it to the uh, session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Any any um any other thoughts or questions or comments? So you can disagree or yes, ma'am. Do you think that people before technology like was so consuming and before social media actually had more deeper, truer friendships than they do today, or did it just feel like people are poor at communication now and poor at uh, that average sympathy you're talking about that most people have for the common stranger? That's, uh, I like that question. I, I, I Honestly, I'm the kind of person that is often accused of nostalgia, of thinking things were better at another time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that to be honest. Um, um, but so do I think that by and large, 
there was more there were more deeper richer relationships that people had absolutely I think that my experience I I, 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 I see the change again I've been, I've been dealing with people dare I say most of you all's age for about 20 years and uh, I, I, I think that I think that there's more isolation there's more loneliness there's more of a sense of kind of being being adrift how do I get connected in in in, in, in is not just in, in closer friendships there's other webs of relationship that you know in in, in old you know, these are kind of obvious things but look at the loss of community I don't know whether any of y'all are, are, are local here from the Shenandoah Valley I've now I'm just I'm an adult comer to the but I've, but then again, my adult life is longer than the number of you have been alive. And I've been in the Shenandoah a long time, and I'm telling you, if some of your all's ancestors, for some of these people that I've met, or relatives around here, there are some amazing people that still can tell you about a time right outside these doors, not very long ago. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna romanticize it and say everyone was just skipping along with happiness dust, but hard working communities that were connected to one another, where people knew they belonged when you went away and you came back, you felt like you were accounted for and that you belonged and they knew how, the whole thing of people sitting on their porches, I'm a believer in this kind of thing, of people that sat on their porches and knew how, knew people by name and knew how to talk to people. This to me is the natural stuff of human life. And, and your generation particularly, has, it's been taken away from you, by and large. And, and so, I mean, and along those lines, I say, yeah, I, I, I think you're going to have to do something to try to, to reconnect, to set, up, to set up webs of smaller communities, and they can, and they can come in, in, in levels. But then particularly one thing that always, most of all, immediately in your power is, 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 is close is the close relationships of friendship, that, but you, of course, remain fully capable still of doing it. I just think when I go to the thing I was talking about, of we're losing the context, and we've got these habits. I mean, habits of I love going to a good movie, folks. But I mean, thank you for. I mean, just as in general, as a habit of what think, something that young people do together, it's not the best way to get to know people. And you go out and you spend the time in the movie, and then you come back, and and, and people kind of go their way. It's just. These things have become absolutely standard. We don't even think about that, but you compare that to where they didn't have movies to go to, and so, you know, I don't want to be silly, but maybe they were even shucking corn together, and the thing is, when people are shucking corn, they talk, and they knew one another, and it's just the truth of the matter, and it makes a difference in their connectedness. How am I doing? Good. I mean, am, am I addressing your question? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, do you think it's human nature to always try to find one more friend, or do you think you can be satisfied with the number of friends at some point, because I mean, like that. If you thought that you're always looking for more friends, then that could explain. Well, with the prevalence of social media, that could explain the phenomenon. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think. Um, I don't think it's human nature to always be looking for another friend. Though I, I but I think we can find ourselves in that situation. De kind of depend, particularly if what we have. Hasn't really gone deep. I mean, and this is this is the thing. This comes back to, gosh, can anyone really do it? I mean, a lot of people are very jaded on this, and will say, my experience in life shows, even after a while, I had a relationship with this person for a long time. I really thought it was going to work, and then bam, and just you know, forget this. It just doesn't work, right? But 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 to the extent that we actually succeed in going deeper, I think the reason that it often can look like people are always looking for another is because we haven't done the third kind that he's talking about and so we and so we're feeling that natural hold that he's talking about of we need to hear and be heard and and part of the thing I, if I might say that we have to watch out for is also sometimes it just seems the, the new is going to be easier anytime you're getting to know someone better there's going to start to be problems Right? I mean, you talk, think about romantic relationships for a while. And got, you know, the, the new often just looks better. But, but in, because there always has to be an, an enduring, deeper cultivation. So I, I, I think to the extent that we succeed, um, I mean, I put it to you this way. I'm, I, I'm blessed, and I don't say it's because of, that I in any way deserve it. But I have a wife that I'm very blessed to be married to. And I always would love to have more time to talk to her. We're never going to have enough time to talk, but we, we talk. 
but I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't need to look. I'm not saying I'm never tempted to, but I don't need to look outside, because, because there's always more right here if I'm willing to go there. Thanks for asking. Yes, ma'am. What a great question. No, but but I love I, I, I love the issue, and it, it seems to me that um, uh, I, I just find myself thinking I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if if someone with that kind of disability uh, might actually, in the craziness of our culture, have an advantage by kind of having to tune in. Um, I, I, I but you know I I. Do you have any experience with that, or? Um, it's something I'm interested in. I, 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 I hope you I hope you pursue it. I mean, the whole realm of, of, of um, right. Um, and the great thing is, you know, human connection is something that we're all capable of, and, and it, some disabilities will be challenges for that in different ways. But you know, the, surely that's something that's something that can be overcome. <coughs> and we could probably be overcome in a. In a Unique, beautiful way that we could all learn something from. I would think. Yes, ma'am. Kind of in response to that, I might argue that um, Aristotle would say that you have to look to like what's relative to us, like what we can do given our circumstances, how much we can achieve um, given like what's relative to us. So perhaps we have to just look towards a different mean of or, or a different way of evaluating those kinds of relationships and communications. I mean, I'm not. Not a subtle scholar, but that's I think he might, he might say something like that. I, I think that's I think that's I think that's very reasonable. And realize that I mean the beautiful there's different there's different ways for Aristotle. Human communication is always going to be rational communication, but if it's if it, and just because someone's not hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth, um, you know, doesn't mean that that, they, that I can't be communicating with them rationally in some kind of way. But I, I do love I love I do love the issue of bodily presence. Of, I, I, I'm a firm believer that kind of bodily presence, face to face. This is another thing that's in that book that I was talking about of, of people barely know how to look in other people's faces. And there's a lot of studies about the importance of being able to to make eye contact, to actually have person to person contact with somebody, and and, and and again how the technologies are literally making us lose a basic ability there. So honestly. I don't mean this to sound, it was about to sound patronizing. I was going to say, I'd much rather talk to someone who can't hear me than someone who's addicted to these things, to, to be honest. I, I think that's a greater disability in, 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 our, in our making human contact with one another. Sir? Yeah, kind of going off of that, I'm actually in a sign language class right now. I'm me. actually learning sign language. And, and part of that, you're learning about the deaf community. And it's actually a very close-knit community, so I would exactly. say that within that community themselves, because there is a fewer amount of people, those friendships are generally more true friendships. I bet, I bet. And like you were saying with the face-to-face -face communication, uh, when you're signing to someone, it's not just you know simple signing. If you sign and you're just looking at them, that's the same as speaking to someone in a monotone voice. So when you're actually talking and in conversation, you really need to convey true emotions through your body language, your eyes, you know, the way you use objects around you. So when you're talking to someone like that, you're really using all of your emotions in one conversation. You're really making true points to that person. As compared to, like you said, talking to someone that's just like on their phone, like if I was like this and talking to you. Right. You know, you can't do that in right. that community because you need to convey true emotions right. you know, throughout the entire conversation. And that so I just think that the true friendships really grow more so. I want to take that class. That, it's very that, fun. That, actually. that very sounds fun. incredible. Wow, thank you for sharing that. I, 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 what final question? Um, so, kind of a perspective of a different community, thinking about like autistic, the autistic community, and how you were talking about that eye to eye contact and those personal relationships. Like, I don't know how you think that like Aristotle kind of would have addressed that because, like, I know especially in that community that eye contact, those um, things like that, are, and the conveying of emotions yeah. as well can be very, very difficult for yeah. people on the spectrum. And so, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but they also tend to have 
people on the spectrum also tend to have very few deep personal connections, typically with really close friends yeah. and family. So they seem to have smaller, tight-knit groups, but they also have that struggle with making the eye contact, can they right. things like that? I, 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 who am I to say, but I find myself thinking in a similar way that people that have those challenges, I almost wonder whether to a certain extent it takes them out of some of the banalities that where you kind of assume that you're, you're in the fast lane of being well in contact with people and you have to make specific efforts to tune in and I wouldn't be surprised if they end up in important ways um, being, being better off, but maybe that's easy for me to say. Thanks a lot, I appreciate it.